All right. All right, all right. Okay, so I went through the uh, default course assignments, default grade calculation. If you go through all of these areas and you get a web app running, then you get an app. And if you produce runnable example code for all six default topics, then you get a B. Well, actually, that's not right. It should be five. If you produce runnable example code for all six default topics, it's not quite right. I want to fix that right here. That, that would mean you have everything. So write code. If you produce runnable sample code for the first five default topics, B. There we go. And then uh, if you produce runnable example code for three of the default topics, you got to see, I'm look at, I'm focusing on example, runnable, runnable example code. That's what I want to see. So when you do research, you're going to be researching these things, whether you're using my assignments, the default assignments, or your own self-defined assignments. I want to see code. This, this course is about programming, and I want you to use this GitHub to, uh, to put your code, your runnable example code, send me a link to your code in the, in the email reports that you send to me, and I could check it out. It's a runnable example code. So you got to get the run. I can't imagine. It's, it, it's uh saying here. If you don't write the code, it's hard to digest these topics. You know, writing code really gets you um, to more fully understand what, what you're reading about. All right. Self-defined assignments. If you want to do that, you know, submit an R&D proposal, identifies the topics you want to research, so on. How uh, your course grade is to be computed. And um, send me the R&D proposal in an email. And uh, there's the rest of it here. Now you can revise your R&D proposal. So, um, you know, you don't have all the information now. Maybe you're, but I mean, the typical thing is for people to say, well, I'm going to do this, 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 this thing. Got this giant list. And they're lucky if you can get one of them done. So um, that's just the nature of the beast. I see it happen all the time. And uh, so you're likely to make revisions to your R&D proposal. So you could do that. Don't send me a proposed change in a separate email. Make it part of your weekly progress report email. So I got a lot of emails to, uh, to, 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 uh, to manage this quarter. So changes to your R&D proposal, embed them in your weekly progress reports. All right. And that's that. So let's see, I'm going to pop over to, let me look at syllabus. I'll see if there's anything in here. Oh, ah, readability criteria for source code. Uh, so um, there it is, you know, consistent indentation. Does indentation follow a consistent policy? So if you're indenting in an inconsistent way, sometimes you use three spaces, sometimes you use two, that's very confusing. And so that makes it hard for me to read your code and it makes it hard for yourself to read your code and everyone else that wants to read your code. Just one example. So all the, the criteria that I've listed here are all important in my, uh, in my opinion, and uh, the things like clear responsibilities. So the responsibilities of functions and classes clear, consistent with their names. You should be consistent with their names, right? So if something is 
as, uh, as destroying something, you don't call it to, you know, create widget, you call it destroy widget. So uh, names have to be consistent with their, um, with the responsibility and the effects of a function or a class. So it's just a common sense. This stuff is common sense. When you read this stuff, it's going to be common sense. And maybe some of it's not. And uh, like this, these two I just added recently, you know, over the break here, a narrow scope. Our identifiers given as narrow a scope as possible. So this one uh, is important. This one is important. And uh, maximum specificity. Our conditional expressions, are there conditional expressions that could be made for it's more specific? So I came up with this just recently. Like for example, this x equals minus one. That's a very, uh, that's more specific than x less than zero. So this, if, if this condition is sufficient for your program, use this condition rather than that condition because it, this is more narrow. It matches against fewer, uh, states of x this matches against many more states of x one of them being the one that you're interested in so um that's an example there maybe that's a little hard uh, to grasp without coming across that in your own code anyway here's this business i think that's it for the syllabus and let's see i want to don't want to keep talking forever here so git branches i showed that git pull JavaScript link right here. And uh, I found this javascript.info. This is an excellent uh, overview of the JavaScript language. It's just fantastic. So I'm going to put this down as my recommendation. I find this very useful. And um, so I started going through this actually. It's, it's quite good. Let me give an example go into the introduction here. So, um, whoop, let me go back. JavaScript language. Here it is. It's like a book. It looks like there's 14 sections. And you can see the colors, see the, the purple there. This is where I, before I started recording, I, I thought, you know, I better look at this first. And uh, I read through the introduction, it's excellent. This introduction is outstanding. And uh, of course it's got these sub, sub sections to it. What is JavaScript? This is very useful. And I don't wanna just read this to you, you should read this. It's very good. And uh, comparing on like, what's the confusion with the Java language and things like that. Here's the coffee script, TypeScript I was talking about. And then, uh, JavaScript comes from, there's an international specification that JavaScript is based on, ECMAScript it's called. And um, some good manuals, the uh, MDN, this is uh, MSDN, that's was, was very good, this MDN I tend to use. And uh, these compatibility tables are pretty useful. And I gave links to that, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And these code editors, there's a link on code editors here. Was integrated development environment, a powerful editor with many features, operates on a whole project. There we go. So this Visual Studio Code, now I don't use an IDE to do web development. I use an IDE to do my programs like, uh, you know, like a video game, desktop program, you know, Visual Studio or Xcode. Those are the two IDEs that are the most commonly used. I use them both. But to do web development, I, I, I never liked using an IDE. And I still don't. But you could use one if you wanted to. And these are two of them right there. Now, in addition to these IDEs, there's a lighter weight editors. Here's this Visual Studio Code. And it's nice because it's free. And the lightweight editors, they also list Visual Studio Code. And they list, well, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to use it as an IDE, which is this you know, do everything logic levels thing. 
It's, uh, it's just an editor to work on individual files. You can use it in that, that manner. And so I, I downloaded this yesterday. You can see it right. Oh, I had it in there one time. But I did um, download this uh, Visual Studio Code. And uh, from Microsoft, and I'm, I'm using Mac here, so it runs fine on Mac, and it, it does seem pretty good. Just like code completion, and, and uh, I might be able to run something. And so, so I'm going to look at this. That's something I'm learning. Uh, Atom is an old free. Free is good. Um, Atom, pretty nice. Sublime is I keep shareware. There's like an optional. Course. This was very popular with students a couple of years ago. I don't know if they're still using it. Notepad++, that's an older system that was also free and used a long time ago. I like to use Vim, you'll see me using VI a lot. And uh, but that's, for, that's for old people though. Or sysadmins, this can be very useful. Because it's, VI is everywhere, except for Windows. It was, uh, whatever system you boot into, find yourself Working inside of it, the console window, you're gonna you're gonna have VI, not necessarily Emacs, but you'll have VI everywhere, unless it's Windows. Okay, you want to go. So <clears throat> that's nice code editors, and oh, this is very important. Developer console. So uh, let me just get this. Let's do some examples. So I'm gonna let's do a hello program right now. And uh, well, one way to do it is this thing's in the way up there. There we go. That yeah, thing kind of gets in the way. Let me, um, I don't know, I'll just go to, uh, go to another page. If you go into, let's see here. I don't usually do it like this. This is, uh, Maybe be under window. Window. Not there. You know, this, this, this zoom thing is, is messing me up here. I, I think you can't see that, but it's, uh, it's in my face. All right, view, developer, view source, developer tools. These all go to the same thing. And normally I pop up the JavaScript console, unless you're going to be using that a lot. So down here is the console window. You'll see you can you know, look at the elements in your web page here. There's not a lot of space in this thing. And um, sources um, has to do with some other information you can look at. And uh, network. And um, the thing is in my way again. Local storage, we'll be using that. It's already in some sample code that I have committed. Okay, but uh, the main one is this console, and there's an awful lot of, I can clear the console here. And here, this is a, um, this command prompt. We can, we can uh, type things, you know, like um, x equals three. And then I'll just do uh, console dot log, and I'll print x, so it should print three. All right. It's undefined. That's the value console returns undefined. So uh, this is the this is the window. Now let's suppose you wanted to to run this code in uh, in a file, and I'm going to do that for you here. This is the repository. I'm going to show you this. Here's the, uh, the course website. And you'll see this is the wiki. And this is GitHub. And uh, this is my, my user ID. And this is the name of the project. And this is, uh, you get a wiki with your projects, optionally. And if I click over here on code, this is the, uh, the code in this project. And I maintain that in this, this directory I have right here. It's 405-2020, it's on my system. Just to show that to you, it's, uh, it's on, I keep it on the desktop. 
here it is, and I've got a bunch of subfolders and files in there. You can see them here, right? Here's the CSUSB DT2. And there's the, and if I just do a LS here, there's the CSUSB DT2. Since so I can push down, you'll see that Firebase JSON, right? Functions, functions, Firebase JSON. So these are the files that I'm working on in my local file system. And uh, so you can look at these. See, this is a JSON object. So when you see these braces like that, and you've got the, oh, you look at, there's the file extension, JSON. So here's an example of JSON being used uh, for configuration. Uh, let's see. So I got some subfolders in here with some, some sample code. So if I, if I make a directory here, I'm going to call it, um, I'll call it lecture one. And I'll go into lecture one and I'm going to edit, uh, say, I'll look at uh, hello.html. Um, hello and uh, so this is a web page. I'm going to just drop a, a script element in there. All right, it's a web page. I'm going to do like this. I'll just do h1. You know, and I'll call it web page like that. That's an H1 element. And then this script is, uh, is kind of hidden. But we could put, uh, it'll run. This The code that's in the script will run when the web page is loaded. So I do console uh, log, and I'll just say hi with a bunch of eyes so we know it's us. And that's it. Now, this, this prints this thing not to the web page, but to the console. And that is the, uh, here it is, developer console. This is the developer console right here. Uh, so um, I got, there it is, it's the hello.html. If I open, now uh, you might, this might not work on your system. You might need to open this using, uh, you know, file open. You could do it like this, file open. And, uh, there's lecture one, that's hello. Uh, here's that web page. See, that's the H1 element. Right there, web page, and then the console is to say hi with all those eyes. There it is down there. See, now this we still have some of the old junk here, so I like to clear that. I just click that. If I reload this, you now it just says hi. Maybe we want to modify the web page. We don't want to just go into console. Let's let's go ahead and and to insert the stuff in the web page. So let's create a div, give it an ID, and I'm going to call this a underscore div. That's a convention I'm using now. And, uh, and I'm going to put um, by in there. Okay. And I'm going to explain what I'm doing in a second. So um, this div, which has an ID, just says by right there. Let's see, we're still turning to the console down there. Now I want to change the contents of this div to from by to high. So now these IDs, when you set an when you set an ID attribute on a on a on an element, and I learned this last year, one of my students taught me this in this class. Now one of these these IDs that are set inside as attributes inside these uh, HTML elements, you can they become uh, globally accessible from your JavaScript. So I can refer to that as a underscore D. So this name right here comes in as a, as a globally defined variable. And so that this a underscore div represents this element. So this is the, call it DOM, the document object model. Document object model means you can, in JavaScript, you can interact with the elements of a web page 
with script. That, that's that's the meaning of document object model. So there's a um, this a div is a type of um, object. I mean, let's see if I can uh, console.log. Let me just show you what that looks like here. It'll, it'll say uh, object. Right? You may give it a constructor, which is like a HTML element or something like that. Let's take a look. Oh, it just it displays it right there. Look, look at that. It shows the div. Very interesting. All right. So, uh, so what I want to do now is I got that div. And I want to call this. It's got a bunch of uh, functions on it, and this is uh, inner text. Uh, divs have a have a div elements have a function called inner text. We're going to set that to hello. I'll put a semicolon there for now. And now when we load the print, we shouldn't say bye anymore. It's going to say hello. Right? So you load that. And now it says hello. So that's how to write things in. That's one way to write things in the document. Anyway, this just showing you how to use the console. And this is how you work. You're going to do work like this. You're going to end up writing things into your web page using something like this. Or whatnot. By the way, there's another way to do this. I should show you the standard approach document. This this is kind of a you don't see this a lot. I mean, I that's why I didn't know about it until last year. But it, I find it so convenient, incredibly convenient. So I have this convention that whenever I set uh, an HTML element with an ID value, I, I start it with some kind of one letter with an underscore. So A, usually I think of it as application, or in my code that I'm working on now, I think of it as authentication. So it's the authentication code. Everything starts with an A, and then I have game code, because uh, tic-tac-toe game. So I start things with a G. So if I had my, if this had to do with uh, authentication, I would do a div. And if it had to do with uh, with the game code, so I, then I would have it as a G div like this. And um, so it's convenient. Like I said, but it's yeah. I don't see it. I don't see developers using it. But it's it's amazing that it works and it's it's very convenient. Well, the way people would normally do it is say in the document object they call this uh, get element by ID, and then you give the name of the element a div, and that's the same thing as this. So I'll just comment that out. Once we get this element, then we can set its inner text to this also works. So let's watch that. This also works. So that's the, uh, you know, I'll do it like this. Look at the difference between these two. Look how simple this one is compared to this one. So it's irresistible to keep it, make it this simple. I mean, the other way to break it up, of course, would be something like this. And uh, I would do something like uh, const, I'll say uh, E for element, or I'll call it like this. A underscore div. This, by the way, overshadows, it overwrites or overshadows, I guess, the, um, the global variable that's implied by the setting of that ID up there. So this will cover over this, this one. And uh, so we could do something like this. We could get the object. That didn't work. <clears throat> screwing this up. There we go. We could define this variable a underscore div and then use this inner text uh, property and set it to hello. We could do it like that. Anyway, so these are all equivalent 
different um, approaches. Let's let's test this one just to make sure that one works. Hello, it works. It's just hello. We do this, it's still it's going to work, but I'll just say hello. It's uh, well, they all do the same thing. So. Um, So now I'll show you what I'm going to be doing. So I, I did this development here and there it is. So now this is the root of my uh, working directory. If I use git status, it shows me that uh, some things have changed. Well, this, this changed and uh, I don't know, I guess I could fix that. So, this is an untracked file. So this is an existing file that I must have modified. And um, I can look at, uh, I can go git diff uh, tag toe index.html to show, oh, I see, I deleted this and I added this. Oh, this is, I'm just making notes about um, things like TypeScript and so on. Uh, so, uh, Let me go back. So that's a change I've made recently, and I didn't commit that yet, but this is a new folder. So this is untracked. So now we're in Git here, and this is Git status, shows this. I'm gonna add this. So I'm gonna do Git add lecture one. Now if I run Git status again, ah, now lecture one shows up. Well, as it being a folder that contains a new file, hello.html, and that will be, that has been added to the index or the staging area. That's why it's listed here under the section, changes to be committed. So this is a change of this file, this new file will be committed to be committed, but I haven't committed yet, so I just staged it. But this other change, it's not staged. So that, that change, the changes remain, the file remains there with its changes, but it's not being written into the repository. So then I'm gonna go git commit. So I'm gonna write the changes. I need to set a message. And I'm just gonna do like add it um, lecture one folder. There it is, git commit, minus n for the message that's required. And here it says one file change, create, load, so on. So there it is. Now if I do uh, git status, again, it's git status. And it says here that change is nuts. There are, it detects, git detects changes in my working folder that have not been stored in the repository. So it's showing me those. It says this is not, these are stages, these are changes that aren't staged. The stage for commit, they're still there. Also my branch, I'm in the master branch. And uh, origin, origin is the, that's the name of a remote repository. And uh, this is master's the name of a branch in that remote repository. So the, the uh, Git repositories are comprised of branches. And normally you have multiple repositories and you, you know, basically, you know, synchronize them all the time. And uh, so the repository that's in Git, GitHub rather, my version of, I have a repository in GitHub that I refer to with the name origin. I can look at that. So if I go Git remote, see it shows an origin right there. And if I use Git remote minus V for verbose, it shows me there's two operations. There's a fetch operation, a push operation, fetch. Obviously there's two different directions. 
So for fetch operations, the name origin refers to this, which is a URL on, on not a URL, but a, yeah, I guess it is a URL. Anyway, it has the address of GitHub here. So this identifies uh, an endpoint that you can make a TCP connection to. And this is the, uh, you want to connect with as, I'm not sure, that's like the protocol probably. And um, I said, I don't know what the notation is there, but that's my username. And this is the name of the remote repository. That's for fetching and it's identical. It's the same for pushing. So it says here that uh, my branch, well, the branch I'm on, it says right here, I'm on branch master. My branch, my master branch, my local master branch is ahead of my remote master branch by four commits. Oh, so I have, I have other commits that I haven't pushed yet. Use git push to push your local commits. So I'm going to do that. I'll just do git push. And there we go. And I come to here. This is the web view of my repository, the remote repository. This is origin. Now the thing is, uh, I have to refresh the page in order to see the changes. So there it is. There's lecture one. You'll see in there, oh, there's hello HTML. That's it right there. See, so you can look at, you know, the code. If I present the code in these lectures, I'll usually I'll put them into the repository. And you can get this, you can check out if you want the copy of this repository. It's just do this. You can uh, copy this, copy that link right there. There it is. See, that's, look at that name right there. See that? That, 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 that's like a URL or whatever. That's just, that's identical to, to this right here. So that's the name, that's the location. So if I go to some other area, so I'm going to make a directory called temp here. I might. Well, let me make a directory called temp x. There we go. Make directory temp x. I want cd into temp x. And um, if I do git clone and I paste in that URL, and you can do this. You can do this with anyone's public repository or any repository that you have access to. And uh, there it is. There, see, there, there it is. A CD into there, and basically, that's the um, that's repository. It's a way of, for you to uh, check out my code or other people's code, uh, or your own code. You create a repository in GitHub first. That's the easiest way to do it. You go to GitHub and you create a new repository up here. See, new repository, and then you clone it. And you are going to end up, well, when you create the new repository, put a readme file in there. I think you need to have one thing in there. And then you clone it and then you modify it locally. And then you push, like I showed you, you have to, you know, add, commit and push. And then you'll write your changes up to the remote. All right. So I'm going to kill this, this temp X, I don't need it. So I'm going to remove recursive force temp X. Careful with that RF. All right. So that's just a basic introduction, how to use the browser, how to access this, uh, how to use GitHub, how to look at the console in the browser. You need to know how to do that. Let me see what else I want to do here. So now I'm reading through this documentation. That's a developer console. I know I wanted to cover that with you. And so you, you don't have to use Chrome. You can use Safari, Firefox, all the others are good. Edge. They all have a they all have a JavaScript console, so they all have developer tools. You just have to figure out how to do it, right? So in Chrome, it's under uh, View Developer, you know, one of these things. That's the same on the other browsers, or similar. Or similar. 
And let me see. And I'm going to go to the next page. JavaScript fundamentals. So we did the introduction. Now I've got these JavaScript fundamentals. And you can see what I read through. I see all the purple. I'm reading through there this use script, use strict, and, uh, and so on. And uh, I'm already pretty familiar with all of these. I mean, I don't know everything though. And after fundamentals comes this other stuff. Oh, the script tag, so I explained how that works. I didn't explain how it works, but I, I showed an example of that. And you can read through this. What's a statement? Semicolons. Semicolons are optional, by the way. But uh, I, I read through this. This was very interesting. That this leads to an error. You can omit semi semicolons usually, but this is an example where semicolon cannot be omitted. And the reason is because, see, this is an array. And this for each is a function that all arrays have. So when I give the array dot for each, I'm calling the for each function on the array. They're passing in a function into for each. That means what for each does is it looks at each item in the array and it calls that function and passes the item into it. And uh, the reason this fails without the semicolon here is because this, this bracket here is, uh, is, is considered as part of this, uh, this line. So that normally a, a leading bracket like this, is a bracket like that is, is the beginning of a, uh, of a uh, what do you call it, a, an array. So, the browser looks at it like this. It looks like, it looks to the browser, the browser says, oh, this alert is an array reference. And this is the, 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 the lookup operation into the array. This, is, this syntax is not right anyway. I, I don't think you can pass in. Oh, the comma, because the comma is valid operator. So this becomes, uh, you know, this turns into trying to find a element at location two. So anyway, this this doesn't make sense. So you need to put a semicolon here. So that's an example. So what a lot of programmers usually do is they just use semicolons everywhere, just to play it safe. But I've noticed some um, good programmers that don't use semicolons in JavaScript, and I guess they they're good enough that they can catch these little issues here. And this is very uncommon, by the way. This is not a, this example. That's the best I could come up with. I mean, it's not a bad example, actually, because I've seen this construct before. But it's not very often. I mean, I'm not even sure I would ever use this. I've read this. I've seen other people use this, this, this pattern. But I, I, I'm not sure I've ever used it in my code. So, so my code may, all the code I've ever written may have been safe with, without semicolons. Anyway, that's semicolons. And, uh, this documentation, the strict mode, this is all very good variables. That's data types, data types are very good. You know, this is JavaScript as a language. I'll warn you that it's it's kind of simple. On the other hand, it's very messy and leads to a lot of weirdnesses. And um, there's some mistakes in the in the language, basically. Big in, I have never used this. And uh, I'm interested in that. You've got to put an N at the end of your literal here and then that then this becomes typed as a as a big integer and uh, so that's the data type big int and then you have strings and strings are immutable in JavaScript and uh, I'm not going to get into this your booleans you have the null value that's its own data type null is its own data type and that data type only has one value in it called null Undefined is a different data type. It's its own data type and it only has one value in it called undefined. So null and undefined are considered data types and they're also values within their data types. Now, it's pretty much everyone's opinion that 
two of these are not needed. You don't need a null and an undefined. You only need one of them, one or the other. And um, that's one weakness. And then you've got things like, uh, what is it? If I can find this. What is type of operator? This thing is, uh, let's see whether they admit there's a mistake here. The result of type of null is object, but type of null should return null. So that that's wrong. Blah, 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 blah. This is an error. This is an error in the language. The language definition itself is flawed. And they have other flaws as well. Uh, but fortunately, they don't come up. They don't influence us that often. But every once in a while, you do get uh, messed up from the flaws in the language. And they do have flaws. That's why this section, although it sounds very simple, data types has got some, uh, some valuable information in there. And every time I read this sort of thing, I always learn a little bit more. You know, so you're not going to get everything all at once. I guess you know that. And uh, you just sort of chip away at it. But I, I got to say, one thing is uh, with this material, it takes a lot of time to digest it. And it's, you can't really get it by cramming, at least I can. I have to uh, give myself a little bit of it every day. I just have to feed myself it. And, and I can assimilate a new information over time. It's very hard to cram this stuff and learn everything all at once. All right, let me keep going here. You know, I don't want this to get type converse is very important to operators, of course, and comparisons. Um, uh, maybe I'll talk about that stuff later. But all of this is uh, is important. So I read through this this morning, and I thought just to get ready to talk to you. And uh, that's good. And so this is the here to talk about code quality objects. Objects are not simple in JavaScript. In data types, functions, prototypes, and inheritance. See that gets you classes. You know I've never used. I never wrote a class in JavaScript. I mean, mainly the language has been evolving, and this is a new syntax. And it adds a little bit to the language, but mainly it's a, it's a reorganization of this, uh, these prototype-based inheritance. Uh, so I looked at that this morning, and I'll, I'll spend some time on that. And this area promises. This is very important and hard to understand. And I've been avoiding promises because you don't need them. I mean, I like callbacks, and I've been using callbacks. And, but there are some problems with callbacks by themselves that you can get into what's called callback hell, or the pyramid of hell if you have a big colon, where you just have so many things, one, one chunk of code, one block of code, uh, embedded inside of another, and you just have too many indentations. It becomes unreasonable to manage. And then you've got problems that where you've got to, you need to sequence out operations, and you, you can't do one operation until another one completes. So you have to use callbacks for that, and that can you know, multiple indentations, and it's very messy. The promises really make it uh, a bit easier to work with. But I find them difficult to understand conceptually, and like I said, I've never really used them. I've never written a promise that I used in any code anywhere. But I'm, I'm, they're heavily used in Firebase, so I, I'm at the point where I need to um, master promises. So I'm, I'm working on that, chipping away at that. It's async await, you know, I'm going to read about that. I read half of this maybe, and modules are also important. A module, you know, when the JavaScript gets very large, when you start writing a lot of code, you, you have to organize it. So you use modules to do, organize your code into into modules. And um, there hasn't been a very um, good way to do that in JavaScript for, for a long time. And these are some libraries that people have been using, but apparently it is now getting built into the language, the, uh, the use of modules, I believe. So I'll have to read that. So there's parts of the language that I, I don't know about because I, I haven't really kept up with it 
as it's been evolving over the years. The JavaScript language itself, although, but like I said, you can't keep up with everything. I've been looking, keeping up with other things. And I have just enough knowledge to, you know, get things done using JavaScript. But now when I'm looking at Firebase, and they're heavily using promises, it's like, well, I better mask the promises now because I'm not going to be able to, I'm not going to be able to finish the work unless I understand how promises work. So not something, and this is hard. It's going to take time to understand that. So that's something you've got to chisel away at. Let's see, is there anything else I want to talk about? Let me think. Um, where was I? I was in this lecture section here. Some links I wanted to talk about. These two links, they're inside this JavaScript tutorial. I just wanted to show those to you. JavaScript compatibility table. So the language itself, JavaScript. And this shows, uh, you know, so the language has evolved. It's got different um, uh, elements to it. For instance, const here. Okay, let's see the const uh, uh, label. You know, it's uh, available in these execution environments, but not in this one, right? So it's not. Well, this is a what is a polyfill they call it. This is for adding functionality to old browsers. And uh, these, this here is uh, desktop browsers. So here's two different desktop browsers that don't support the use of cons. So these these browsers will will choke if you're using cons. But these others, and uh, these others support it. You'll see they're all green. It's nice here that they show this, uh, they could still branch here. So it, it can break it down. What does support mean? Well, these are the items. So there's, there's actually 18, 18 items of, of compatibility that, that are uh, looked at. Uh, for instance, this one here, like, 16 out of 18 are covered by this temporal dead zone and temporal dead zone strict mode. These are not supported, say, for this uh, TypeScript plus 4JS3, whatever that is. So this table is very good. This has to do with, if you have a question about the language and whether it's supported in the environments that you're targeting, you can see the desktop browsers. There's a lot in there, this big list. You can use this table to check to see if a language feature is supported in the environment you want. Now, that's just the language, but when it comes to the execution environment and what's available to you, like, you know, am I in a browser? That means I can modify a web page. And at war, maybe I'm inside a Unity, and I'll, at least I'm, I'm, I'm running in a game. So, you know, it's not, it's not a web page. I've got a different set, I've got a different API. So this is the, this can I use, this site is, is very useful. And it, it, it documents um, what parts of the JavaScript API are supported in the different browsers. Uh, for instance, Canvas, the Canvas element. I'll take a look at that. The Canvas element is, uh, you know, is not supported in Internet Explorer version six to eight, but it is in versions nine to eleven, and so on. Uh, so this is very, very useful, and uh, sometimes the notes down here are very useful as well. So if there's a feature like, say, the Canvas element, if there's a feature of web pages. A feature that you want to know if you could use in your system, then use this. Can I use to check that the, the, the target environments uh, will support it? For instance, if you wanted to, if Opera Mini was important to you, you wouldn't be able to use Canvas because Opera Mini does not support uh, you can't sell that. All right, so that's uh, that's my overview, and probably talking too much. Uh, that's the lecture and for today. And I don't want to I don't want to create too many long lectures. And if you if you go on through the default course assignments, I'm going to be sticking to these assignments when I do my lectures. But if you're not going to follow the default course assignments, you're going to do something else and skip my lectures. You don't have to listen to these lectures. 
This is optional. Even if you follow the default course assignments, you don't need to listen to my lectures. I'm just giving this to you um, as, a, as an option that you could make use of you know, what I have to say about these things as we go through that. Of course, if you want me to talk about something specifically in any of these topics, then, then uh, shoot me a message and, um, and I'll try to get, uh, I'll try to work that into my presentation uh, so that you have a, an answer for that. Okay, so that's it for today. And um, just to remind everybody, you got to get me your R&D proposal. That's just a note in an email. You send me an email. Email. Where are you going to send the email? Just send it here, dturner at csusb.edu. And uh, send me that email. And then that's it. That's the start of the class. Make sure you send me one email uh, in, these, in these windows, roughly once a week. And that's it. That's it. So, so let's see what we can get done this quarter.